I've always loved working the night shift. Well, until something happened that made me change my mind. I found that during the night people would be more generous and would tip me more. I used to work as a bellboy for a well-known hotel in the city. Many famous people would check in there. I don't want to say any names, but think about rock stars, rappers, and show hosts. Of course, besides those, other wealthy and more private people would stay at the hotel. Businessmen. People who dabbled in illegal businesses. The job was very interesting, and the pay? Well, I made from tips triple my salary. Yeah, it was good. So you may wonder, why would I quit working the night shift? Let me fill you in. It was right before Christmas, and business, well, it was kind of slow. Everyone was with their families, I guess, and the hotel was not even close to full capacity. The staff was mostly laying around in the lobby, scrolling on their phones, passing the time. I decided to go up to the roof and take a look at the city. It was my secret place where I'd relax and have some time to myself. Ah, I exhaled as the cold winter wind was blowing from all directions. Peaceful here, isn't it? I heard a voice. I was startled. No one but me would come up here. I turned around, but in the dead of the night I didn't see anyone. Hello? I said while scoping my surroundings. Suddenly, a figure came out from the darkness. It was a beautiful lady, dressed in all red. Excuse me, how did you get here? I asked. She smiled and took out a cigarette. The woman asked me if I had a lighter, and as fate had it, I did, even though I didn't smoke. I sometimes kept one close by for emergencies. I asked her again, how did she get on the roof? After exhaling the smoke, she said simply that, I know the owner. That made sense in my head. Even though I didn't know him or anything about him, I bought the story. We started talking, and hours flew by. The woman was fascinating, to say the least. I was puzzled how she could withstand the chilly air in just a skimpy dress that blew in the wind. There was something that caught my eye. A multitude of marks all around her neck. They looked like bruises. But they could also have been birthmarks. I wasn't sure, and I didn't find it polite to ask her about them. To get my mind off of those strange marks, I inquired whether if she's checked in at the hotel, and she said she was staying in one of our penthouses. I smiled, adding that someday I wish I'll afford that kind of luxury. Eventually, we got off the roof. I walked Matilda, as that was her name, to her penthouse. After she entered the room, I went downstairs in the lobby. Later that night, I heard a commotion upstairs. The sound came from the third floor, but it was so loud that I could hear it from the lobby. As I got off the elevator, I could hear exactly where the noise came from. It came from penthouse number three, the room where Matilda was staying in. I knocked on the door twice, but didn't get a response. The sound of things falling on the floor made me grab my own set of keys. As I was just about to unlock the door, it opened. Well, hi dear, is there something wrong? Um. I heard a commotion. I knocked on the door, but no one answered, so I wanted to make sure that you're all right. That's so sweet, Matilda told me as she touched my cheek with her hand. I didn't notice it before, but you look exactly like my husband, when he was younger, of course. But I'm sure that's the only similarity between you and him. You see, I would often get punished for the simplest things. I stood there in silence, but she continued. A monster is what I'd call him. A vicious beast. Do you know why I love this penthouse? She asked me. I shook my head. Because this is the place where I can escape from him. This is my safe place. I didn't get a chance to respond. I was left speechless after what she told me. She smiled at me, and as she closed the door, wished me a good night. The morning came, and it was time for me to go home. I got my stuff, but... Before I left the hotel, I felt a hand on my shoulder. I turned around, and it was Matilda. She told me that it was her last day at the hotel, but she sure will meet each other again. On that note, I smiled and said that it was a pleasure meeting her before, and went home. As I entered my apartment, my knees buckled. I started feeling really sleepy, but I couldn't fall asleep right there on the floor. I changed my clothes, took a shower, and went to bed. Did you enjoy the first story? If you did, I would love it if you would subscribe to the channel.
I didn't sleep much, though. I was restless. I drew the shades in the entire house, and everything was dark. I kept hearing people moving around my house. I opened my eyes every two minutes. As I looked around the room, I could see shadows moving. It was cold, even though the heat was turned up high. What the hell is happening? I said, and as I spoke, steam came out of my mouth. I put my hand on the metallic, old-fashioned clock I had on my nightstand, and it was freezing cold. The shadows were dancing all around me, and it felt like they were getting closer and closer. I was trapped in my bed, too afraid to get out. They started spinning faster and faster. I closed my eyes because following their movements made me dizzy. And as I did, I had a vision. A woman was being buried in the ground, somewhere in the woods. A man all dressed in black was throwing dirt over what it seemed to be a corpse. Her face looked oddly familiar, but I couldn't quite figure out if I knew her. The only thing that stood out in that entire dark scene that popped up in my head was a gold bracelet on the man's wrist. It glistened in the moonlight. Ah! I screamed all of a sudden at the top of my lungs. I don't know why, but I just did. The entire scene was too disturbing. I started breathing heavily and opened my eyes. The shadows were gone. I turned on the light. I couldn't sleep anymore. All of a sudden, my phone rang. It was my manager. He said that I needed to come right away. The owners will be visiting in about an hour, and he needed all the staff members there. I got dressed, still woozy from the lack of sleep, had a cup of coffee, and off I went. As I got out of the building, the blinding sun rays made it difficult to see before my eyes adjusted. In no more than 20 minutes, I was at the hotel wearing the uniform. We were all in line in the lobby as if we were waiting for the president. A man walked through the massive door. He was pretty tall, was wearing a black suit, black shirt, sunglasses on, and a black hat. He came over and greeted all of us. A little bit rude not to take off his sunglasses, I told my manager. His wife just died. Be a little bit more respectful, he told me. I didn't know that or else I wouldn't have said anything. It was a pleasure meeting you all. I love to commemorate my late wife by changing things up around here, he told us. He was referring to one penthouse that would be completely transformed. The owner said that his wife loved nothing more than the bedroom they had at home. She decorated it herself, and it was the room where she felt most relaxed. He wanted to make one of the penthouses an exact replica of their bedroom, and he'd call it the Matilda penthouse. When I heard the name, I instantly thought about the lady I met the other night. Oh, and the penthouse I want you to modify is number three. As I heard those words, I remembered that it was where she was staying before she checked out as I left the hotel. It couldn't be, I said to myself, the coincidence being mind-blowing. As the owner walked away, his wallet fell out of his pocket. I grabbed it from the floor, and since it was open, I could see a picture. A picture of the lady I met on the roof of the hotel. I stared at it for some time. My wife was beautiful, wasn't she? He asked me. I'll always love her, he said as I handed him the wallet. It was her, his wife, the woman I talked to. As he reached his hand to get his wallet back, I noticed something glistening on his wrist. A gold bracelet, identical to the one in the vision I had. Then it all came to me. The woman in the photo, the woman I met on the roof, and the one being buried, well, it was Matilda. W what happened to your wife, sir? I mean, how did she die? I asked him, trying to put the pieces together. I have no idea. They just found her body buried in the woods. Police don't know who did it, and it seems that they'll never find out, he told me while avoiding eye contact. I then checked the records for penthouse number three just to be sure. As I flipped the pages, I started sweating bullets. I couldn't find the date. But when I did, I couldn't believe my eyes. There was no record of anyone staying there. The room was empty for the past two months. Then it all came to me. I had spent last night with Matilda's ghost. If she loved her bedroom so much, it meant that she would forever haunt the penthouse number three after it was done. And the killer 
Well, if my vision was accurate and her ghost wanted to tell me something, then it seemed that the husband did it. During the next hour, I grabbed all of my things and never returned to the hotel ever again. I talked to a friend, but if it turned out that if I went to the cops, it would be my word against Matilda's husband, who was a rich, powerful man. I couldn't do anything about it, only to live with this secret. Dr. Rudd was not a bad person. On the contrary, the patients loved him in the unique ways their neurosis let them love someone, which for many of them meant obsession. But when the doctor entered their padded rooms, they acted as if their mental disorders didn't exist, as if his mere presence exercised their demons. Maria would stop pulling her hair and screaming about her poisoned cats. Simon's mood would stabilize with no hysterical crying or laughing and no calling out for his mother as he did when the nurses came into the room. And Greg? Well, Greg was still something else. I don't even think Dr. Rudd would get him out of his bindings. At the time, I believed that the patients continued to love him even after they were released from the hospital, which happened once a month, sometimes evoking his face and voice to control their impulses in a possible relapse. Dr. Rudd was aware of the strange adoration, the smile on his face when some nurse or other doctor mentioned about the strange effect he had on the patients indicated that he was aware of it and appreciated it. But Dr. Rudd didn't seem like a bad person. He worked more than anyone else at the hospice, something unusual because the hospital that regulated the institution and paid our wages didn't care about overtime. He would arrive shortly before me, around 10 o'clock at night, and only leave after 3 in the afternoon of the next day during Amanda's shift. He never sleeps, it seems, Amanda whispered to me one day at the shift change. Orlando says he lives here in a separate room. I've never seen him take a nap during the night, too, I said, but I've woken up several times with him walking through the lobby. Unlike him, I've tried to take a nap everywhere possible, which usually happened after I heard his footsteps entering some patient's room and then the door closing. But more than once, I was surprised by him already in the lobby, looking at me with his smile and saying, Hello, Miss Fontaine. He pronounced my name with a bold French, which made him more attractive. I felt extremely embarrassed. Then he would go through the lobby again as if nothing happened to enter another room where the patient was more agitated. The only time I saw his strange smile disappear was when I was surprised at the reception by the mother of a patient who had been released more than six months ago. The lady told me that she had found out that her son was admitted at the hospital, that they had not seen each other for years, and that she wanted to see him and apologize for anything that had happened between the two of them. The patient's charge showed him as a nobody, with no family or friends. The emergency contact field was empty. I called the doctor and explained to him privately about the situation. His face became serious and it seemed that he was breathing faster. He told me he would take care of the matter and took the lady to his office. She left the office almost an hour later, crying and walking past the reception desk without saying anything. Dr. Rudd then appeared on my desk. Apparently, the patient never went home, he said. I will report this to the police. I don't want to have to say this is confidential, Miss Fontaine. There it was, perfect French again and his firm way of speaking. I nodded. That night, I wasn't able to sleep and I kept listening to his footsteps coming and going in the hallway until 3 in the morning. He really didn't seem to sleep. At a certain time, when the lamentations of the patients had ceased, I heard the phone ring in his office, but he didn't show up. Then it stopped, and it was my desk phone's turn to ring. From the crying voice on the other end, I soon deduced it was the mother of the missing patient. She sounded desperate and urged to speak to the doctor. I told her to wait on the line and that I would go look for him. As I went out into the white corridors, peeking through the glass windows and looking for him inside the rooms, I found him in Maria's room, dimly lit by the hallway light, sitting on the bed next to her. Something made me knock on the door right away to call him. It could be for any reason. Maybe it was because I didn't want to interrupt his session with Maria for fear of triggering a hysterical reaction in the poor woman, as happened quite frequently. Maybe it was because I hoped he would turn his face and he would see me there and leave the room to ask what the problem was. But it was probably the strangeness that filled the room the strangeness with which he sat beside Maria and put his hand over her face, covering her eyes with his fingers and the eerie reflection of the light on the glass of the room that looked like a silver glimmer leaking from the poor woman's eyes. It was this same strangeness that made me leave and walk silently back down the hall and wait at my desk until he returned. 
Hello, Miss Fontaine, he said to me minutes later as he entered the lobby. I returned the smile, but I felt strange. As if I had seen something that I shouldn't, I transferred the call to his office and sat quietly in the dark for the rest of the night. Maria was released the next day, or so I heard from Amanda. I wanted to ask her if she or anyone really saw Maria walking out the doors, but I couldn't. The unspoken question gnaws at me these days, but I strongly believe that I shouldn't have asked anyway. I had the feeling of knowing the answer and also of knowing that no one would ever see Maria again. I've had many jobs throughout my life, and a lot of things happened during those experiences, but I'm not going to get into those right now. I just want to tell you guys about the time I worked as a security guard at a brand new mall. I just moved to a new city. I didn't know anyone and didn't really have any leads when it came to a job. The day I rented my apartment, I went out to buy some stuff for the house. You know, milk, soda, and some veggies. As I was standing in line at the grocery store, I heard two people talking about this new mall that just opened up at the edge of town. I took my stuff to the house, got into my car and started driving over there. I wasn't even thinking about a job at that moment. My phone was about to die and my only charging cable was busted. Finally I arrived and expected to see a sea of people since the mall was new, but it only had a few people there. I went in to look for a store to buy a new charging cable and I stopped at the information desk. The lady was so nice and gave me directions and I was turning around to go toward the store and then I saw a help wanted sign right next to her. Excuse me, are they looking for a new security guard? I asked while checking out the details written on there. Oh yes, dear. Are you interested? Yes, I just moved to town and I really need a job. She smiled at me and picked up the phone. In no time, another security guard came to greet me. He was tall, thin, but had a warm smile on his face. We chatted for a bit, went to his office, and before my trip to the mall was over, I was hired. The only bad thing was that I had to work the night shift, but I guess it was better than nothing. The next day I woke up pretty late, knowing that I'll be up all night. I made something to eat, you know, the usual, I don't want to bore you with these pointless details. The sun went down at 10pm and I was in front of the mall, excited for my new job. I knew I wouldn't have anything to do, so that's why I brought my iPad with me, so I could be entertained and I went in and the security guard that hired me was in the locker room. Listen, it's going to get pretty boring here, so you won't have to worry about doing much, but just be sure to stay awake. I know I have this problem and that's why I switched to the day shift. He told me, then he showed me around, showed me the monitors that I could use to see what images the cameras were picking up, and then he went off. I was all alone in that massive building. The hours went by crazy slow. I watched so many YouTube videos that I got bored of them and decided to walk through the mall. It was something creepy about it. I didn't know why, but I had a feeling that something was watching me. All the lights were on and even though I had perfect visibility, I couldn't see anyone. Hello? I said, as the echo of the place made the word repeat. I felt like a kid. I remembered that I used to do that with my parents every single time I had the chance, but this time, something different happened. It wasn't just the echo. I could hear a slight, hey, coming from somewhere around me. At that moment, I froze. I didn't know if I'd just imagined it or if there was someone else in there with me. I picked up my phone and even though it was almost midnight, I texted the other security guard. Hey man, is there someone else here? I impatiently waited for his response while looking left and right, feeling anxious. Finally, he responded saying that it's just me and it must be the echo. I wasn't convinced, but I decided to take his word for it. I said hello a couple more times, but that slight hey couldn't be heard. This reinforced my trust in what he had said and I returned to the office. I sat down and noticed that my coffee mug was on the right side of the desk. I'm left-handed and I would always place it on the left side. I must be losing my mind, I said while not knowing what was going on. I moved it to the correct side and then started another YouTube video. I was watching a popular creator and he was doing a series where he reacted to viral funny videos. After that second video where someone fell off a skateboard and landed on a Christmas tree, I heard, ha ha ha, coming from right outside the office. I immediately got up from my chair waited a bit and then went out to see what was going on. As I took my first step outside the door, something grabbed me by my leg and I fell flat to my face. You're new here, I heard a voice coming from behind me. I turned face up and saw a man dressed in all white. He had a knife, so I tried to crawl away from him. Don't worry, I'll just mark you so that the other one will know I got you first, he whispered menacingly while twirling the knife in the air. What, what are you talking about? I'm, I'm going to call the police right now. 
I got up and tried to intimidate him, but he just laughed. He was quite skinny, with red dry hair and a lot of small scars on his face and arm. Call them, they're my best friends, he said while smiling. I didn't know what that meant, but as I tried to go around him and get to my phone, he swung the knife, cutting my jacket and slightly piercing the skin on my arm. Are you insane? My voice trembled. At that moment, he got angry. His entire tone of voice changed. Don't call me insane, he yelled while charging at me with the knife. I managed to put my hands in front of me and grab the handle, but he was pushing so hard that it was hard for me to withstand his attempt at stabbing me. The knife was getting close and closer to my chest. I was trying my hardest to push him back, but it was like he has superhuman strength. All of a sudden, he dropped the knife before falling on his back. Behind him, there was another security guard. I tried to call you, so I knew that something was wrong, he said while holding a taser. I thought you were just imagining a voice when you texted me, but the more I thought about it, the more I remembered how much this nut job broke into one of the stores I worked in a couple of years ago. See this scar I have? He's responsible for it. It seems that this guy was in and out of a mental institution and even murdered a couple of people up until now. The police were called and they took him away, but he didn't stay locked up long. About a week after that, he was caught yet again trying to break into a house. The police car was patrolling the area when they saw him. I continued to work for the mall for a couple of more weeks, but after that, I found a new job. And since then, I never worked the night shift again.